Let me ask you a question as we just begin here this morning. Have you ever heard yourself recorded? Have you ever been uh, subject to that experience? Maybe you can think back to the first time you, you heard yourself in an audio recording and you thought to yourself, Ooh, is that my voice? Is that really what I sound like? It's pretty rough, huh? Have you ever wondered how other people hear you? And what I mean by that is not the, the audio quality of your voice, but the character quality of your voice. Does your speech confer grace upon those who hear? Open your Bibles up to James chapter 3 this morning. We're going to be taking a look at uh, the first 12 verses here in chapter 3. And the book of James is concerned with practical Christianity practical Christianity, and that makes it essential reading for those who are training for or presently involved in pastoral ministry. We need to have a good handle on practical Christianity. And James addresses a number of topics in this, this great little letter here, but, but the one that we want to look at together this morning and one that I think is really important for us as pastors is the issue of the tongue. Control of the tongue. The human tongue weighs only two and a half ounces. It's amazing. It's just a small little thing that the Lord has given us, and, and yet it can bring no end to misery or embarrassment to the owner. Often for those in ministry, the, the misuse of the tongue can undermine all the good that we're trying to do. It, it, can, it can cut the legs out from under those who have been called to a ministry of the Word. And it can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. For example, you find yourself in an elders meeting. You're surrounded at a table with, with men of God and they're passionate men. They wouldn't be there for the most part if that were not true. And in the midst of the conversation, the, the back and forth and so forth, passions can rise. And, and people in an unguarded moment can say something that really cuts deep. You could find yourself verbalizing some sort of a, a questioning of even the motives of those around the table. Maybe the discussion has to do with your, with your evangelistic approach there, and, and one person is really pushing for this, and, and others are not. And, and in the course of the back and forth, someone questions a man's commitment to even the concept of evangelism. Those kind of words, once they come out of the mouth, they cut deep. The wounds are very, very deep. And, and listen, brothers, if, if there is not a healing to occur and occur quickly in that kind of context, the church can become polarized and we can be pulled apart. Just the, the use of the tongue in a meeting. In the pulpit... How we use our tongue is very, very important. I was reminded of this myself not just but a month and a half ago. I was preaching away and, and I went off my notes. And when you go off your notes, you're, you, know, you ought to know you've walked into a minefield. It is really dangerous. And I, and I just made an off-the-cuff remark about speaking in tongues. And the congregation all laughed. And I moved on. And I didn't really think anything about it. And then... A couple of brothers came up to me that following week and said, you know, David, can I, can I talk to you about something? And, you hate that when it happens, but yeah, talk to me. And they said, you know, when you, when you made that remark, that, that little joke about tongue speaking, and everybody laughed. They said, the person next to me wasn't laughing. They come out of a vineyard church, and they're, and they're here because, because they want to hear the Word of God exposited. But when that happened, and everyone's laughing, they, you could just see them close down. you got to be careful. Just these off-the-cuff remarks, jokes, sarcasm, whatever, it can be hurtful. It, it, can, it can prevent the very message that you're trying to get through. It can obscure it behind a, a slide or an offense. So, careful in the pulpit. We need to be careful in our response to those who, who approach us to offer suggestions or, or criticism. We can push back in a, in a defensive kind of way. Again, a, an illustration out of my own life. We, 
We have been going through a, a period of time at Foothill Bible Church, and it's been a long and peaceful ministry there. It's been 20 years of peace. But two years ago, we went through a, a bit of a painful transition musically, and, and we've moved to a more contemporary style of music, and the Lord is blessing that. But in the process, we were working that through, particularly with some of our older saints. And after service, this uh, older man came up to me, and, and uh, you could tell by the expression on his face he wasn't happy. And so he, he started to say some things to me, and, and instead of just saying what I should have to him, which is, can, I tell you what, can we, can we just have a cup of coffee tomorrow and talk about this? I pushed back. And, and again, after the fact, I thought, oh, you idiot. You idiot. Call a man up, seek forgiveness, have that cup of coffee, and talk this thing through. And we did, and, and the Lord just spread his grace and mercy over the whole situation and the, and the guy's fine. But just in that moment again, a, a bad use of my tongue. Feeling defensive, feeling like I was being threatened. Gossip. We're not immune to such things, my friends. Right? The, the latest uh, scandalous details that we want to hear and under the guise of, of shepherding. You know, we just want to shepherd these people so we want to know all that's going on. We can fall prey to all of these kinds of sins of the tongue. Brothers, a living faith, a living faith produces external changes. External changes. And one of the places where that external change needs to show up is in the use of that tongue. The use of that tongue. So this morning, what I want to do with you from this text is, is I want to look with you together and, and find a, a three-part strategy. A three-part strategy for gaining control over the tongue so that we will not undercut our ministry of the Word. That's where we're going this morning. Three-step strategy. Step number one. Remember that your tongue is important. Remember that your tongue is important. Verses 1 and following. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. In taking up the topic of the tongue here, James begins by addressing those who are in the leadership of the church and in particular the teaching ministry of the church. Those of us whose, whose ministry among the people of God comes primarily through the mouth. James begins to talk to us. You know the Proverbs say, Proverbs 10 and verse 19, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable but he who restrains his lips is wise we are training here at the master's seminary for a ministry of the word a, a ministry a speaking ministry and and I just have to tell you when you are involved in a speaking ministry the opportunity for you to misuse your tongue ratchets up exponentially exponentially James says we and notice he includes himself in this we who are teachers we will incur a stricter judgment. He's talking here, I believe, about the Bema seat. That is that we will be called to account before the Lord for the use of the giftedness and ministry opportunities that he has provided. We will be evaluated based on the quality and the consistency of our teaching ministry. Do we handle the scriptures rightly? And equally importantly, do we live rightly in conformity with the message that we preach and teach to others? Do our lives back up the teaching ministry of the Word? You know, judgment comes, my friends, according to a principle, and the principle is this, the greater the influence, the greater the accountability and responsibility that come to us. Dr. Mayhew was talking earlier about those two men, right? And, and one in a, in a church, uh, an average-sized church of 75, one that has been entrusted with a, with a larger sheepfold, and you think to yourself, man, I'd love to have that big sheepfold. Be careful what you ask for. There is a tremendous responsibility that comes for the lives of that many of the people of God. We are accountable. And we are accountable not just for what we say in the pulpit, my friends. We are accountable for what we say outside the pulpit as well. People are paying attention to what pastor says. Notice James goes on and he says for verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. 
If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. James makes a really candid admission for us here. He says, he acknowledges here that, listen, we stumble. That is, we, we catch our foot and we, and we kind of trip. And he's speaking metaphorically here about sin, of course. And he's saying that we are sinners. We are, we are sons of Adam with cleat, uh, feet of clay, and we have been placed in a position to act as a, as a spokesman for God. We stumble, we trip, we are blame-worthy of the sin that, that we so often fall into. He goes on and he says that if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Listen, if you can avoid sinning with your tongue, then you have grown in your Christian faith. You are, you are a man who is showing maturity in the work of the Lord. You are, you are able to control other aspects of your life as well. The tongue is, is in a sense like a thermometer that it measures one's spiritual temperature. The ability to control the, that two and a half ounce muscle that lies between your teeth translates into the ability to control your whole body. Isn't that fascinating? If you can control that little thing, James says you can control your whole body as well. And he, and he illustrates this principle for us here in, in verses 3 and 4. And he does it with the, with the bit and the rudder. I ask you a question. How do, how do you control an animal that weighs 1,000 pounds, that can run 25 miles an hour with a 200-pound man on his back? You were talking about a massive, powerful animal. The answer is you, you put a bit in their mouth, right? That's what James says. We, if we put the bit into the horse's mouth, verse 3, that they will obey us, we indirect their entire body as well. We put it in their mouth. We don't put it under their tail. We put it in their mouth. If you can control the mouth, you can control the beast. He goes on in verse 4 to, to talk about the rudder. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds. They're still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Ships of the ancient world were large. We're told in Acts chapter 27 that the, the ship that Paul was being taken uh, to Rome on was a, was a grain ship. It had a large cargo of wheat and it also carried 276 people. That's a good size sailing vessel. And yet that ship, uh, that large ship, and despite the strong winds, the size of the vessel, and all of those factors can be controlled by a, by a small piece of wood fastened to the back of the ship, wherever the pilot decides that ship needs to go. The bit, the rudder, these are, these are illustrations. And so James applies them here, verse 5, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. The bit, the rudder, small, seemingly insignificant, and yet they direct the course. The tongue is the same way. It's small, it's seemingly insignificant, and yet it has such powerful influence on the future direction of our lives and our ministries. Our ministries. See, he says, verse 5, see how great a forest is, is set aflame by such a small fire. A little Greek particle there, right? Edu, look, behold, pay attention, sit up, open the eyes, shake off the lethargy. I'm talking about something serious here. You can burn down the forest with a simple flame. Boy, how we in Southern California can relate to that, right? Seems like every year we manage to burn down several thousand acres of timber. And inevitably it goes back to that small spark, that small flame. Destroys large forests. Such is the power of the tongue. Such is the power of the tongue, Jane says. It is like the power of the flame. And again, it's small, it's, it's seemingly insignificant, and yet it produces great outcomes. It only takes a spark to set a fire ablaze. We need to remember 
that our tongues are important. That's the first step in this whole process, gentlemen. Remember that your tongue is important. The second step. Realize that your tongue is insubordinate. Realize that your tongue is insubordinate. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Realize your tongue is insubordinate. Your tongue is insubordinate. James transitions here, beginning in verse 6, from, from the importance of the tongue to, to the outcome of a person's life. And he does it by really introducing kind of a shocking series of statements about how dangerous our tongues really are, how defiant our tongues really are. James says for us here that, that your tongue is not neutral. It is not neutral. It is your enemy. It needs to be tamed. It needs to be brought under control. It's not a neutral thing. It's the very source of evil, he tells us. And it's absolutely untamable, this side of glory. My friends, it's going to be an ongoing fight. It doesn't matter whether your head is gray like mine or, or whether you're still young and got your color. It's going to be an ongoing fight. Progress, yes. Final victory, not this side of the grave. This is a fight you are going to have to have regularly in your ministry. The tongue is a fire, he says. Verse 6, the very world of iniquity. Set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. Set on fire by the course of our life. And is set on fire by hell. James isolates the tongue for us as the, as the focal point of iniquity. A focal point of iniquity. Now, Jesus says, right, that these things come out of the heart. Right, Matthew 15. It's out of the heart that come all of these terrible things. But James focuses on the fact that it is the, it is the mouth that gives voice to that evil that resides deep in the heart. It is the tongue that vocalizes that evil. The Proverbs speak often about the tongue, both positively and negatively. For example, Proverbs chapter 25 and, and verse 23 the writer says, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. Just as surely as the north wind brings in the storm front, brings in the rain, a backbiting tongue draws forth anger from those who have been lashed by it. Go to, go to the bank on this, gentlemen. Go to the bank on this. The way you use that tongue, and again, I'll refer back into a, into a board meeting. The way you use that tongue among your fellow elders will go a long way to the, to the success or lack of success of the ministry in which God gives you. You can undermine all the good that you're trying to do behind closed doors with an inappropriate use of your tongue. It brings no end to the ministry or misery, rather, and, and the heartbreak it can cause you. And the difficulties and trouble it brings to other people. One of the ways that the tongue brings forth its poison is through criticism. Criticism. It's the temptation we all face, right? To, to vocalize the things that we're not happy about. 
And I don't care who you are, I don't care what ministry you're in, there's stuff you're not happy about. And so there's that temptation to begin to vocalize it, and to vocalize it in a way that is dangerous and destructive. It's a temptation for pastors to to criticize the church to which God has called them. Isn't that crazy? God has called us to, to, to be among these people, to shepherd the flock of God among you, 1 Peter 5, and yet we can find ourselves with this critical spirit towards the very people who Christ loves and and gave himself for, and we are called to love as well. You know, we have a critical attitude towards them. It's not uncommon at all for pastors to to be in a setting and and begin to become critical of the facilities that God has entrusted to them. Oh, this place, it's so shabby. You know, that sound system, it's just awful. And, And a pianist, you know, she... She's, uh, you know, creaking this thing out, and it's like using a squeeze box. And Oh, you know, if we just had such and such, and critical, critical, critical. That kind of approach to ministry saps the love, saps the joy out of what God has called you to do. You begin to see all the things that are wrong, you know. Everywhere you look now, all you see is what's wrong with the ministry, and in particular, the facilities. Or we can become critical of the, of the members of the church themselves. We just begin to see them. These people are so immature. Oh, Lord. You know, you get the kind of the Moses thing going. Oh, Lord. Kill me. You've trusted these people to me. You know? They are so immature. They're like spiritual pygmies. You know, I work hard all week long and I studied at the Master's Seminary and I know Greek and I know Hebrew and I know several other people. And, (laughs) you know, and I prepare this rich message and I bring it to them and they're like stones. Oh, Lord, what is wrong with these people? Maybe it's what's wrong with you. You should go back to expository preaching and take it again. We can just become so critical. Our people are lazy. We begin to get that kind of feeling about it. They're, you know, they're just half-hearted. They're half in, half out, you know. Lazy people, they won't do anything. They're spiritual people. We just begin to grind away like that. And my friends, if you begin to think like that, you will begin to vocalize that kind of attitude. And, and people will pick up on it. They'll pick up on it. It's legendary how pastors criticize the elders, right? It's just legendary. If it wasn't for these elders, Lord, we'd get some things done around here. And again, that kind of critical attitude transcends and, and comes out in our speech. Or probably one that many of us fall prey to if this church were only bigger. If this church were like Grace Community Church, then I'd be able to preach like John MacArthur. Not so much. You know, there was a, last year I was walking through the sporting goods store, and as I want to do, I like to try on baseball gloves. I love the game of baseball. I wasn't as good at it as I would have liked to have been, although the older I get and the more my memory fades, the better I, I get at it. <laughs> and uh, I was walking through the store, and, and I saw this glove, and it, was an, and it was a handmade Italian leather baseball glove for $395. And I put it on my hand and I thought, if I'd have had a glove like this, (laughs) I'd have made the pros. I'd have made the pros. My wife looks at me and she says, you're left-handed, that's a right-handed glove. (laughs) Details, details, you know. (laughs) We just had something bigger, more prominent, Better exit off the freeway. More signage. On and on it goes. Discontentment, critical spirit, all of these things play in and then come out through the mouth. You know, I read a great quote when I was getting ready for this. It's um, one of the writers says, quote, When young we whine, when old we criticize. I kind of like that. When young we whine, when old we criticize. Reminds me of the story told about uh, John Wesley. 
Wesley was deeply vexed by those who enjoyed having the exercising the spiritual gift of a critical spirit, right? Among the, the people of God. And, and one day after he preached, there was this lady sitting out there with a critical spirit, and, and she just glared at him the whole time he was preaching and specifically focused on his tie. She's just got her eyes locked on his tie. And, and so after services, she, she came up to him and she told him, she says, uh, the strings on your tie are too long. It is, it is vain and an offense to me. Wesley says, anybody got a pair of scissors? Called for a pair of scissors, and they brought him a pair of scissors, and, and he handed them to the lady. He says, why don't you trim the tie to your liking? So she proceeded to, to trim some off of the tails of his tie. Then uh, Mr. Wesley said, now let me have those scissors. He said, I, I hope you too will not mind a little bit of correction. He says, Madam, your tongue is an offense to me. It is too long. <laughs> Stick it out. I'd like to trim it a bit. <laughs> you see, Wesley was a traveling evangelist, and they can get away with saying things like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're out of here. You know, if God has called you to shepherd the flock among you, you yeah. don't follow Wesley in that. <laughs> Sets on fire the course of her life, verse 6. And set on fire by hell. Gehenna. The place outside the city of Jerusalem where, where they burned the city's trash. The place was a filthy, stinking, belching, smoke, disease-infested garbage dump. And James says that this is a perfect picture, both of, of the future of eternal torment and a picture of the place where the destructive fire of the tongue originates. It comes right out of hell. An uncontrolled tongue, my brothers, is like a direct pipeline to hell. It belches forth its filth. It burns us and it burns others. How many churches get torn asunder by people's use of the tongue? Critical attitudes, destructive speech, and they rip apart that for which Christ himself died. Verse 7, 8, he goes on, and James talks again in analogies here. He's talking about the, the various beasts and, and birds and reptiles and creatures. And he said, listen, man has tamed all of these things, but no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. It's, it's full of deadly poison. He's just further driving home his point here. He's saying, listen, we've made a lot of progress, right? We, we've, tra we've tamed the animal kingdom, and yet we can't tame this thing. We can't tame this thing. It, it is notorious for breaking out in poisonous speech and words. It's, it's reckless. It cannot be trusted. It will not stay in its proper place. You need to realize that your tongue is insubordinate. That is the second step of this strategy. You need to recognize or realize, rather, that your tongue is insubordinate. Finally, step three, you need to recognize that your, your tongue is, or when your tongue is inconsistent. You need to recognize when your tongue is inconsistent. Verses 9 and following. With it, this tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. We all fall prey to the tongue. We all fall prey to the tongue. In our best moments, we bless God. In our worst, we curse men made in His image. Such inconsistency. We can go from praising to cursing that fast. Just a split second, a right provocation, push the right buttons, and what would come out of your mouth is shocking. What has come out of my mouth is shocking. It is deep and it is deadly. And so James tells us here is we need to recognize that when it's happening. He draws here upon the, the, 
the consistency of nature, and he uses that to compare to the inconsistency of our human tongue, our speech. He talks about fountains. He talks about trees. He says, listen, you know, a good fountain produces good water. Good, good trees produce good fruit. Vines produce a certain kind of grape, and olive trees produce olives and so forth. And there's no confusion in that matter. The creation is, is much more consistent in living under the sovereign authority of God than you and I are. He uses this, these analogies here to, to exhort us, to exhort us men to, to bring our speech in line with our new nature in Christ. That's how he's closing it down here. He's saying, listen, you are new in Christ. Your, your speech needs to reflect that reality. It needs to reflect that reality. How does the change come about? How do, we, how do we bring about change in our speech? The answer when the New Testament would give us is to walk by the Spirit, right? We need to walk in the Spirit in these things. That is, we need to, we need to be moving in the same direction the Spirit is moving with regard to the tongue. Practically speaking, how? How, how do we go about this? Let me, let me just suggest a few things for you here. Begin with your time of prayer. Pray regularly and pray specifically for control over your tongue. Recognize that, that this, this two and a half ounces of trouble needs, to, needs the, the focused work of the Spirit of God. So ask for help. Think about it. Pray and ask for help in mastering your tongue. Secondly, Refuse to, to participate in the obvious sins of the tongue. Refuse to lie. Refuse to gossip. Refuse to, to flatter. You know what the difference between a flattery and gossip is, right? When you flatter somebody, you tell them to their face what you would never say behind their back. When you gossip, you say behind their back what you would never say to their face. And James would have us not participate in either of these sins of the tongue. When you fall, remember what he says earlier, you know, we all stumble, we all trip, we're, we're, we're going to fall, we're going to fail, we're going to sin. In this way, when that happens, we need to repent. We need to repent, and we need to repent immediately, we need to repent completely, and we need to go to that person or persons, and then we need to humbly seek their forgiveness. And that's hard. I mean, after all, right, you're the pastor, right? You're the pastor. You're, you're the guy who's closest to God, right? And you know that because whenever there's dinner, they always ask you to pray, <laughs> right? Because they want the guy closest to God to pray. <laughs> they only knew. Repent. Go to the person. Humble your heart before them. Seek their forgiveness specifically. Make Restitution as necessary. These are hard things. These are hard things. These are, these are hard lessons to learn. But they're required. And we are to grow in our own Christian maturity, and if we're to, to give leadership among the people of God, then we're not immune to the very word we preach. We need to come under it. And we need to live by it. So refuse to participate, and when you fail, repent and seek forgiveness. Third, Regularly thank God for the good things that he has provided. You know, in Romans 1, Paul lays out, you know, I preached this through Romans a number of years ago, and spent a long time in Romans 1, and I had, a, I had one sermon title, and it was like part 9 by the time he finished. It was called The Deep Dark Descent into Sin. And as, and as you begin that section there, Paul, Paul identifies something I think is really important about the pagan mindset that, that ends up in this spiral of sin. And that is they are not thankful. They are not thankful. The lack of a thankful heart brings about no end of, minister, of misery. One way to dampen the fire of discontentment and, and a critical spirit, and, and you know what, you know if you're kind of tend that way. All right, if, you, if you look at, at the world and the cup is sort of you know, half empty, that's sort of the way you've been wired, then you need to really cultivate a thankful heart. You need to be looking for things to be thankful for, and you need to, you need to verbalize that to God. 
beyond that, you need to, you need to verbalize it to others. And so that leads me to, to the fourth way to, to apply this, and that is to, to look for evidences of grace in other people and then communicate it to them. You want to grow in your love for the flock of God? Be on the lookout not for their errors, not for their shortcomings, not for their sins and mistakes. Be on the lookout for the evidence of grace in their life. And then tell them about it. It is so encouraging when you receive that kind of input and when you give that kind of input. Hey, Joe, I know you've been struggling. But, you know, this last year, brother, I, I can see God's grace in your life. I can, I can see that, yeah, I know you're not being regular in the Word, but I can see you're trying. And, and I can tell when you're, when you're being faithful with it, it. It shows. Really, Pastor? Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. And that just encourages them and, and, and wants them, makes them want to try harder. And, and it gives you a new perspective about Joe. Rather than Joe being the guy who's always in the corner of your office, you know, waiting outside your office door to drag you down, now Joe becomes someone in whom God is working and you can see it. Finally, practice Ephesians 4.29. Practice Ephesians 4.29. If you don't have anything good to say, button it. Right? Zip it. You know, if you're sitting in a, in a meeting or you're somewhere and, and there's something going on, you're being provoked in your spirit, you know what? Just don't say anything. Just pray. Zip the lip. And uh, usually it passes. You can open your mouth and you can bring no end of trouble to yourselves. Man, James has a lot to say here. I pray that, that the Spirit of God would take some of it, some of what you've heard this morning, would drive it deep into your hearts. I pray that God would bless you with a long and fruitful ministry of the Word. Let's pray. Our Father, what a privilege and what a responsibility it is to be a man of God called and gifted by your Spirit to stand in the pulpit and to preach the Word of God to your people and to walk among them and to, and to live the Christian life among them. And, and Father, there are so many ways that we stumble and fall in this task. It is too much for us. And yet, our Father, your Spirit continually encourages and strengthens us for the task. And, and James has these words to say to us about the importance of the way we we manage our speech. May you help us even this morning. In the balance of this day, O oh Lord, help us to bring that two and a half ounces of trouble under control. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.